Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're going to call the September 5th Airport Commission meeting to order. May I have a motion and a second to uh, to approve the minutes? Any discussion? Any any discussion? Any corrections? Hearing none. All those in favor of item one, say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Motion carried. May I ask who's on the phone? Yes, I'm sorry. President Reed's on the phone. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Item number two under ordinance. An ordinance authorizing the city to enter into an airport aid agreement with the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission to reimburse the city up to $350,000 for direct cost incurred by the city for the marketing and promotion of air service at the airport. May I have a motion and a second to approve item 2A? So moved. Second. Okay, and this will be presented by Antonio Strong. Uh, good afternoon, Commission. Uh, this is great news. Uh, the airport received a grant award of $350,000 for marketing and promotion of air service at the airport. The Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission awards funding for the promotion of domestic or international commercial air service in the state of Missouri when funds are available. Funding for this program is made available by the commission when proceeds from jet fuel and aviation fuel taxes exceed more than 4.5 million, but not more than 6.5 million. The airport will be required to provide matching funds totaling 38,889, <clears throat> and the amount from the commission will total 350,000. The grant will be used to promote our airport as a local airport of choice and promote the entire St. Louis region as an attractive destination for domestic and international travel. At this time, we request your approval to enter into an agreement to receive grant funding from the Missouri Highway and Transportation Commission. Any questions for Antonio? Yes. Just have one comment. Um, the, the trust fund right now is very strong, mm -hmm. so the likelihood of getting this grant again next year is really good. Unless something changes, but uh, was just up in Kansas City, and um, the city aviation director indicated that we're already at that 4.5 level. That's great, because you know, there were a couple of years when we didn't reach that, and right. we didn't get any any monies, which was tough. So it's great to have the it's great to have the monies available. Any other questions for Antonio? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of item two, say aye. Aye. All, aye. all opposed. Motion carried. Item three under operations, the approval of an amendment to the agreement with Service Master Contract Services Incorporated to provide carpet cleaning service for the airport. The agreement began October 1st, 2015 and will now end October 31st, 2019. The not to exceed contract amount will be increased by $70,284 from $300,000 to $370,284. This first amendment extends the term of the agreement by 12 months and increases the not to exceed contract amount by 70,284. May I have a motion and a second to approve item three. So moved. Second. And Ron Stella will present. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a one year service contract extension for airport carpet, carpet cleaning services, which would begin on November 1st, 2018 and end on October 31st, 2019. The service agreement is needed to provide cleaning and maintenance for carpeted floor surfaces in Terminal 1, Terminal 2, and Customs. The term of the agreement began November 1st, 2015, and by this amendment will be extended an additional 12 months to end October 31st, 2019. Service Master Contract Services Incorporated was founded in 1982 by Robert Smith and currently has three metro St. Louis area locations. The firm has provided carpet cleaning services at the airport since 2015 and is an experienced and excellent service provider. The company provides similar services for SSM Healthcare <coughs> um, and Charter Communications in Bridgeton, Missouri. For this contract, the last 12 months expenditures were $75,075. The one year contract extension not to exceed amount is $70,284, increasing the total not to exceed amount of, to $370,284 from the original service agreement of $300,000. The monthly invoice rate for the one-year extension decreased 6.38% from 6,256 to 5,857 per month. There were no contract changes in the proposed one-year extension. I respectfully request your approval of the one-year service agreement extension for airport carpet cleaning services with Service Master Contract Services Incorporated. 
Any questions for Ron on this one? Just a quick question. Why didn't we just rebid it? Um, we're, we're looking for contracts that make sense just, just to extend where we can and where there's no rate increases. Um, this, this contract's been slowly whittling down because we we're putting more tile in. Um, so it's a much smaller contract than it has been in the past. So we just thought it'd be a good, good opportunity just to rebid it, um, I'm sorry, rather, just extend it for one year. And, and um, so does it, that mean you want to extend it for another year? I don't think so. I think we'll look at uh, where we're at and, and then probably do a rebid at the following year, next October. And Commissioner, one of the ask of the advisory team is that we take a look at those contracts that we can extend for a year during this privatization process uh, so as not to confuse people on what may be going on. So those contracts where we can look at extensions without an increase, uh, we've been asked to try to look at those for one year if we can. In some cases, we might actually look at two years. Well, that's kind of a, that's an interesting thought because that actually seems to go against what we've been actually asking is to not keep making amendments to contracts, but we did those. Right. So do they have something in writing that communicates that? Uh, it is. Um, there. Yeah, I think on the... If you look at their this communication. This might be helpful for us in terms of making decisions. Okay. Uh, I, I can get that, I believe. And okay. I think uh, I think later this afternoon, I believe uh, Ms. Martinez is going to join us and give a presentation. I do know it's one of the slides that they have in the presentation. Okay. All right. And we're doing this where it makes sense and, and where we can with no contract rate increases. And, and you know, we have I a know, couple. but it, I thought at least we were trying to say, you know, because we've had, we've often re-extended them to, mm -hmm. to really... When it's time to rebid them, plan ahead of time and rebid them. Yeah. But this isn't because of, of not enough time to rebid it. This has to do more with the look at the policy. policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. A, a policy that the committee. Or an ask. Okay. From the, from the advisory team that's working. All right. I, I wasn't aware of that. It would be nice to see something. Yeah. Just so it guides us in terms of decisions we're making. Yeah, Rhonda, I think uh, I, I get it. I understand. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about it right. at some point. But, um, be interesting to start tracking how many bids you're going to have to tackle in, in that one year period if we keep extending all these to that point. Now we're saying if, if let's say, for some reason it goes one way or the other, it can be a tremendous amount of work for the team. Yeah. And, and we have brought that up. We have been looking at it. And there are some that do not make sense. And on those that we feel just do not make sense to extend, we are going out for RFPs. Uh, those that, as I said, where we've got the one-year extension where we're not seeing rate increases, if, there, if they came back with increases, I think that would be an argument for us as well to say fiscally responsible, we shouldn't be doing it. I think this is about the seventh or eighth one we've looked at with a one-year extension. Thank you. are welcome. Did you have a question as well? Well, I, I just wanted to say when you're looking at these, so for me, if, if I had been making this decision, if I'm looking at a contract today, I know that the process, the expiration process, is a minimum of 18 months. Um, I probably would have rebidded this for a two or three year contract because even though that part of it would be done in 18 months, it would probably be at least another six months for whatever decision is made, whether we do something or we don't, for us to get back on track. So that brings us at the three year point. So this would have been cleaner for a three-year contract. But for a three-year contract, you would have really gone out for an RFP, not an extension. Oh, well, yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's why I wouldn't have said <coughs> Yeah. So that, and I guess that's why it would be kind of good just to kind of get you a chart in place so that um, we know when all those are coming up and we can, uh, we can look at those in the working group. We can help you with that. Okay. 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 Any other questions for Ron on this? One yes. Kind of just uh, for clarification, Service Master and Service Original, the, the MBE is not the same as the person bidding. No, they have a uh, franchisee yeah. relationship, um, and they're not the same company, though. That's right. correct. I think that they, they so are. The MBE is a franchisee of. I think there's the a parent owner. company, and they're both franchisee, franchisees of the parent company. And they are two different companies, though. Okay. Yeah, they have franchisees all over the region. And so the franchisee that got the award is partnering with another franchisee yes. in order to get the participation. The franchisee that got the award is a 
majority owner. Um, correct. The majority yes. owner is a different franchisee that. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Ron? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of item three say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Ron. Item four under public relations, the approval of an agreement to Morgan Graves Consultant, LLC, to provide the airport with customer survey services. The agreement will begin on October 1st, 2018 and will end on June 30th, 2020. The not to exceed contract amount will be $54,477.50. May I have a motion and a second to approve item four? Second. Okay, and Jeff Lee will present. Good afternoon, Commission. Uh, this is a service agreement for customer survey services with Morgan Graves Consultants, LLC, and Ms. Marnay Morgan is the CEO and is with us today um, in the room. Just wave so they know. There you go. Thank you. Um, this is for a term from October 1st, 2018 and ends on June 30th of, two, uh, June 30th of 2020. Total not to exceed $54,477.50. The SFB process began on April 6th. Three bids were submitted and all bids were rejected and the revisions were made for a second solicitation that went out on June 20th. Morgan Graves Consultants LLC was a loan qualified responsive bidder and thus submitted lowest and best bid. Morgan Graves is the consultant. She is both a MB or the company is a both MBE and WBE but is accounting 75% for it as a WBE. WorkNet Incorporated is the MB partner at 11%. Commissioner, if you recall in May, uh, you approved an extension of the ACI customer survey program for another two years, which will end June of 2020. Now the ASQ program is the benchmark airport satisfaction survey since 2012 that we've used. Um, it was originally fully supported by the RBC and Civic Progress. The ASQ scores are one of our benchmarks that we're using in the 2015 to 2020 strategic plan, which also ends June of 2020. The airport picked up the cost of the ACI program about four years ago, and RBC and Civic Progress have committed to paying the survey team work through this month. Um, that work was being performed by UMSL or IS through the end of this month, um, and that's through their Public Policy Research Center. And um, they determined that they could not bid on continuing their work directly as we moved on to, dir to directly bid it through the airport. So this agreement will provide a new survey team to carry on the same work as UMSL, providing the survey data directly to ACI for our quarterly ASQ reports. The survey team will have the same program requirements, surveying 700 passengers every quarter to yield the results through June of 2020. It is requested that the Airport Commission approve the award for this agreement for customer survey services to Morgan Graves Consultants. Approval by the Board of Estimate and apportionment is also required. Any questions for Jeff on this one? Hearing none, all those in favor of item four say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, okay, thank you. Motion carried, thank you, Jeff. Item five, environmental and safety, the approval of an MOU and a reimbursement agreement to the Missouri Department of Revenue for the provision of environmental services for the airport. The MOU in the agreement will commence October 1st, 2018 and run through September 30th, 2021. The reimbursement agreement not to exceed contract amount will be $75,000. May I have a motion and a second to approve item five? And Jerry Beckman will present. Good afternoon, commissioners. I am here to request your approval of this memorandum of understanding and reimbursable agreement with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. This agreement will replace an existing agreement that expires at the end of September of this year. You may note that in the last 12 months, there have been no expenditures under the existing agreement. This agreement is in place in the event that we have special projects or priorities requiring immediate attention from MDNR. An example of this would be our project for ramp restoration at the former Boeing area or review of the conditions at the former Missouri Air National Guard site. For the Missouri DNR to review our stormwater permit, for example, takes several months typically. Sometimes our projects will not allow for that sort of delay, and this agreement can expedite their response. It is requested the Airport Commission approve the MOU and reimbursable agreement with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. Approval by the Board of Estimate and Apportionment is also required. 
Are there any questions? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of item five say aye. 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 <coughs> all opposed? Motion carried. <coughs> item 6A, under properties. Airlines operating agreement and terminal space permit with MN Airlines, LLC, doing business as Sun Country Airlines, AL-086. May I have a motion and a second to approve item 6A? So moved. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioners. We're requesting your approval today for the AOA with Sun, with Sun Country Airlines. Uh, this is a month-to-month -month agreement for, for a term not to exceed 36 months. It begins October 1st, 2018. This agreement is typical of the similar AOAs you've approved in the past. The airline agrees to a number of terms and conditions that we've previously negotiated with both AUA and AOA care. We've negotiated with AUA carriers and has been agreed to by AUA and AOA carriers. Um, Sun Country is going to begin scheduled nonstop service in October to both Fort Myers and Tampa, Florida. They will be leasing counter space uh, to the east end of Terminal 1 and they will use the gates per turn. We respectfully request your approval of this airline operating agreement and terminal building space permit. And one of the things we're excited about, this is First time some countries do a scheduled service in the year. They've operated charter in the year before, but they actually are coming in with scheduled service in those two markets four days a week. So we're excited and hope that we can continue to add a service with them. Any questions for Rob on this one? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of item 6A say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Item 6B, a space permit with G2 Secure Staff LLC AL 087. May I have a motion and a second to approve item 6B? Okay, Rob. Commissioners are requesting your approval for the space permit with G2 Secure Staff. They have 1,333 square feet in Terminal 1 on the mid level <laughs> um, near exit 14 as you go down the outside baggage claim. Uh, this is a renewal lease. They currently occupy this space today. The term of the permit is three years, beginning October 1st, 2018, ending September 30th, 2021, with a 30-day cancellation provision. Uh, G2 currently provides ground handling services for Alaska Airlines, wheelchair services for Frontier and, and Cape Air, and customer service uh, services for American Airlines. Uh, we respectfully request the Airport Commission approve this space permit with G2 Secure Staff. Any questions for Rob? Hearing none, all those in favor of item 6B say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Item 6C, amendment to the right of entry for permit for the United States of America Army Corps of Engineers. May I have a motion and a second to approve item 6C? Rob? Commissioners, these next two uh, agreements are connected to the FUSROP site, and that is the formerly utilized, formerly utilized site remedial action program. This is envir an environmental cleanup site to the north of the airport. If I can pick it up, it's right in this area right here. This first is an amendment to the right of entry permit for the Corps of Engineers to do their work in the site. Uh, this amendment extends the term of the original right of entry permit by one year and will now expire November 1st, 2019. Approval required is the Director of Airports, Airport Commission, and City Board of VNA. We respectfully request your approval of this amendment to the right of entry permit. And I'll mention that on this agreement and on the next agreement, we follow the government format. Uh, the federal government requires us to follow their format on their documents. Hearing none, all those in favor of item 6C say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Item 6D, right of entry for construction with the United States of America Army Corps of Engineers. They have a motion and a second to approve item 6D. Second. Okay, Rob. Uh, Commissioners, we're requesting your approval for this right of entry for construction. Really what this allows us to do is control the construction. The, 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 the Army, pardon me, the Corps of Engineers would like to, so to build some structures over there. And in their current permit, it really didn't give us a lot of construction language and TCA language. And this will allow us to approve their construction uh, of what they're going to do over there. Uh, there's no other changes to the permit from this. Uh, and this is uh, 
the term is one year from the date of final execution, and we request your approval of this right of entry for construction. Any questions for Rob? Hearing none, all those in favor of item 6D say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Motion carried. Item 6E, the insurance at St. Louis Lambert International Airport Award and approval of bid for the following airport insurance policies. Airport Liability Insurance Company, Star Aviation. All Risk Property Insurance Company, Swiss Re. Business Auto Insurance Company, Granite State Insurance Company. Inland Marine Insurance Company, Lexington Insurance. Public Officials and Employment Practices Liability Insurance Company, ACE, Child American Insurance Company. May I have a motion and a second to approve item 6E? Second. Okay, Rob. Uh, commissioners, I want to introduce a few people. First of all, from our brokerage team and our risk manager. It was a challenging year for property insurance uh, this time, and we really appreciate their assistance. Uh, Mr. Scott Whiteman is here from Arthur J. Gallagher and Associates. Uh, Richard K. Gaines from R.K. Gaines and Associates. And Susie McFarland from White Coleman and Associates. Uh, also, Kat Ruth is our airport risk manager. We're requesting the Airport Commission's approval for five insurance policies, all valid for a term of October 1st, 2018 to October 1st, 2019. And I'll go through them one by one. First of all is the Airport General Liability Insurance with a limit of $350 million. We're recommending that we renew our current policy, our policy with our current general liability carrier, Star Aviation. Star has provided excellent professional claim service and support the annual premium for 2018 will be $181,750, which is a slight increase of $4,250. The deductible remains at $50,000 per occurrence and a $500,000 aggregate. We did add, add a catastrophic management coverage endorsement to this policy, which provides some additional coverages for expenses that may be incurred during certain catastrophic events that may impact the airport. Second is airport property insurance. Our insured value of the property is almost $1 billion. This is increased from our last policy by approximately, 400, uh, approximately $47 million. Uh, commissioners will recall we've taken back the former Missouri Airport Air National Guard site, and we've had some appraisals done of our various buildings that popped up the, the value. Um, this is the end where we've reached the end of a three-year rate agreement cycle with our current carrier AIG. At the end of this cycle, our current, our brokerage team marketed the policy and received three separate quotes for property insurance, which are reflected on the quote summary page attached to the executive summary. Staff is recommending that we purchase all risk property insurance for, in a package assembled by our brokers, consisting of primary coverage from Swiss Re, one of the largest insurance companies in the world, as well as excess coverage from three additional underwriters. The total premium will be $1,093,750. Deductibles will be $1 million for wind and hail, $1 million for earth movement, and $500,000 all other peril. You will note that the quote summary that we provided, the original, current, the original quote submitted by AIG included a higher premium than Swiss Re and significantly higher deductibles that had previously been in place. They put in a deductibles for $2.5 million for both wind and hail and an earth movement, which is versus the current deductible of $1 million. Uh, Swiss Re kept our lower deductibles in place. I want to note that after this airport commission was mailed out to you, after the airport commission package was mailed to you, AIG came back to our brokers and offered a new quote that's not reflected on your summary. The premium that they quoted was $1,172,062 with the same $1 million deductibles that we currently have and that we will have under the Swiss Re policy. While the deductibles are now the same as the Swiss Re package, the premium amount quoted by AIG remains $78,312 higher than the total quote for the Swiss Re primary and excess package. We continue to recommend that the Airport Commission approve the property insurance policy with Swiss Re. As you see, it's a total insured value of $1 billion, consisting of primary coverage from Swiss Re, $750 million, 
for a $950,000 premium and then excess coverage provided by RSUI, One Beacon, and Scottsdale, and they provide an insured for the, the overage of $250 million for a $143,750 premium. The total premium for all risk property insurance will be $1,093,750, which is an increase over last year of $227,888. This increase in premium is attributable to a hardening of the property insurance market as well as the insurance, uh, the increase in our values that I noted earlier. And as I said, property values was, uh, was a challenge this year. Property insurance was a challenge. Next is business auto insurance. Limit is $1 million per occurrence. Staff is recommending that we purchase business auto insurance from our current underwriter, Granite State Insurance, an AIG company. The annual premium will be $187,485, a decrease of $3,815 from the current premium. The deductible is $5,000. Next is Inland Marine Large Equipment. This is coverage for larger equipment pieces used by our operations division. The limit on, limit on mobile equipment is just over $3 million, and the limit on our larger equipment is up to the value of the equipment. Staff is recommending that we purchase Inland Marine purchase from Inland Marine Insurance from our current underwriter, Lexington Insurance Company. The annual premium will be $52,751, a decrease of $9,897 from the current premium. The deductible is $5,000 for mobile equipment and $50,000 for equipment valued over $250,000. Lastly, public officials and employment practices liability with a limit of $7 million. Staff has recommended that we repurchase public officials and employment practices liability insurance from our current underwriter, Ace Chubb American Insurance Company. The annual premium will be $60,747, which is an increase of $1,649 from the current premium. To summarize, staff is recommending five separate insurance policies totaling $1,576,483 in premiums, which is a total increase in premiums of $219,000 $895 over prior year premiums. It's important to note that our brokerage team foresaw these market changes when they were coming. They came to us during our budget process and we budgeted for all of these increases. We respectfully request your approval to purchase these five insurance policies. Only the approval of the airport commission is required. Could you repeat that, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Rob on this? The team did a Really, uh, thanks to, to Cat Group as well. They spent an enormous amount of time going through this along with our partners. So, big thanks to everybody for it. I have more of a comment. Yes. You know, it, was, it was a lot of information, so it was a compliment to Rob for yeah. spending time with him yesterday walking through it and you know, helping explain more information. All those in favor of item 6E say aye. Aye. All opposed? Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the commission, and thank you for allowing me to provide this update. I think uh, hopefully everybody will be pleased in terms of and the results. Oh, okay. I hate microphones. Can you hear me now? Okay. It's not on. We might just have to speak up. To okay, I'll I'll try to talk a little bit louder. That usually isn't a problem. All right. So today what I wanted to just provide was a quick overview of really the airport's achievements in our diversity efforts. So it's just as a quick reminder, we really administer two distinct programs on behalf of the airport, the federal DBE and ACDBE program, and then of course our local city of St. Louis MWBE program. 
Um, so the distinct differences really between the programs really just reside around a couple of key issues, and that is really around how goals are set under the federal DBE program, ACDBE program. Um, the goals are set on a contract basis. That's why when you have concessions agreements that come before you, you will see different goals because it's based upon the availability and what the scope of work and the type of concession agreement that it is. For our local city of St. Louis contracts, those are the service agreements that come before you uh, that you all vote on um, uh, during the commission. Uh, our current city of St. Louis program is 25 and 5. There was an ordinance, which we'll talk about later on, that was signed into, um, into law back in uh, the first part of June, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but the current program and our program statistics are based upon um, the Mayor's Executive Order number 51. Uh, again, those are just some of the few of the, the distinctions between the two programs. Uh, again, uh, the, the most, I think, glaring and most differential that makes a big uh, difference for us here locally is the fact that under a local program, we do not have size standards or a cap when it comes to uh, certified firms. In the, in the federal program, firms will and can do grow out of the program based upon either personal net worth or the, the size of their gross profits. All right, certification statistics. So this is a breakdown of the number of applications that we received over this past year. We had an uptick this past year. We saw or took in 176 applications. As you can see, this is the breakdown we do track between the applications of our breakdown between our local MWBE program and that of the federal program and those that are a combination. Last year, uh, we had about 150 applications. So that was a bit of an uptick of about 17%. Um, when, when I track the statistics and can see usually when, you know, applications are going up or they're about static, it's usually because there's a lot of work coming out. So in the city of St. Louis, and we can see there's a lot of construction going on. I was just downtown earlier today down at SLDC, and, you know, it's nice to see the number of construction companies and things that are going on and so forth. And they come under typically, most of those projects are going to either come, um, as a result out of, of tip development or contracts and so forth. So what does that do? That drives firms to want to become certified, which is great. Uh, certification decisions. So as you can see here, not every firm that submits an application uh, gets certified. Uh, we had 132 with certifi uh, certification decisions. 30 of the, none of those withdrew for one reason or another. 10 were denied. 122 were approved. Now, I wanted to provide a breakdown of the ethnicity of the firms. This is something we've not had the capabilities to do, but we're using a little bit different software system, and this, uh, our ability to break these out by ethnicity becomes even more important as the new uh, MWBE program is implemented. So you can see just very quickly that by the pie chart that um, the great majority of the firms who are certified are of ethnicity and African American, and behind that, Caucasian. And um, we are tracking and working with, for instance, the Asian Chamber of Commerce and the Spanish Chamber of Commerce, because they've been actively working on increasing their numbers and so forth. So we have seen those grow a little bit, as well as uh, Native American. I can remember a couple of years ago, there were just two or three firms that were certified in that area. I could see the information behind scenes, but we didn't have a way to sort of pull it all together at the time, but now we do. So we are at a total of about 884 firms. So, um, Typically, this number has hovered around 750, 775 or so. It really has gone up. You know, firms do come on board and become certified, and firms do fall off or decide to withdraw for one reason or another. Amber? Yes? What is an ACDBE? Program? An ACDBE, it's the airport concessions component to the DBE program. So for our firms who are participating as partners with HMS Host, in this case, um, you know, Hudson and so forth, they have to be certified as ACDBE. And just a quick note, it does have a different size standard, so their gross receipts are much higher. It's 53 million if you are, um, if you're certified as an ACDBE. I have a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. So what, what we, you certify, we certify is for the airport and for the city of St. Louis. Yes, right? we do. Yes. And the St. Louis County, what do they do? 
well, we have a representative for the St. Louis oh, County yes. who is here. Yeah. Who will, yes, exactly. Yeah. My colleagues. So, Jack, if you want, I can speak to it currently. They are they're getting their program underway, yeah. and so um, they've elected not to pursue a separate certification. And in fact, we've had discussions before even Jack came on board, and we just met the other day. They are going to be looking at entering into a memorandum of understanding with the city with us to handle their certification. So what this will do yeah. is, it's another great effort to show that city and county are working together and are not placing an additional certification requirement on firms who are already certified. And that would come to this commission as well. Yeah. Right, Once exactly. Really good. Exactly. There's multiple certification things. You just e exactly, if we, can, if we can eliminate as many as possible, yeah. would be right. would be great. All right, so outreach efforts. So um, one of the things that, of course, that we are always trying to, to do is help to educate not only interested firms who, may, who are looking to become certified, but also strengthen our relationship with various agency partners. This is just a nice little way to sort of outline or provide an overview of the various agencies we've been working with. Uh, we held 18 certification workshops uh, directly here at the airport uh, about over the last six or seven months. We suspended those for the summertime because we weren't getting much participation, but we're getting ready to go back to those. Those are on our website. People register. They, they show up and it's a great opportunity for us to really go through the key issues that surround certification. Uh, we are also engaged in a number of times in going out and doing workshops for any of these agencies as well. For instance, like the uh, Asian Chamber, I did a workshop for them, Hispanic Chamber, any number of them. So we also participate in a number of expos. Now, this will get right down to it in terms of our local achievements here, in terms of our general services contracts. Those are the service agreements that come before the commission. So this past year, uh, what we saw here was um, approximately 37% overall combined, 32 MBE, 5% WBE percent went to uh, certified firms. And this represents payments, the dollars that you see before you, represents payments on all active contracts through June 30th. So, of course, our goal that we're benchmarking against is against the 25 and 5. And again, for, I guess since we started reporting the statistics three years ago, we've been well above that. Um, it's nice to see, particularly in the service contracts, we've seen some shifts and a couple of more firms, or uh, MNWBE firms, becoming primes. That always makes it uh, a big difference. Um, in those dollars and so forth when we see them moving into those roles. And I think that's a great testament to, you know, the staff and folks who work with people and encourage the people to bid and so forth. They become accustomed. Many of them start off in subcontracting roles and they're able to advance and move into prime roles. Construction and professional service agreements um, under our local MWBE achievements and we break these out and you see on the federal because it's due to the funding source. So these are any construction and professional services, meaning design um, contracts that are funded with non-federal monies. So um, again, the numbers represent really, really a, a nice growth um, in our um, over our goal with 34% to MBEs, 12% to WBEs, representing 46%. Go back. And then under our federal funded program. So we're at 22% on federally funded contracts. Um, again, this is, uh, we continue to exceed just slightly a little bit our overall three year goal. Um, for the DBE program, we're required to submit to FAA a three year plan or outlook on, um, on all the uh, federally funded AIP uh, grant funds. So we work with engineering. Uh, Jerry and, uh, and Angel and his group and FAA in terms of rejection of the contracts that will be coming out and we have to do a projection of a goal and we are, uh, we're benchmark against that goal and each year an annual report is handed in. Concessions, very similar uh, process, three-year goal methodology is developed um, for, um, for FAA to submit. So we're in the beginnings of a three-year, new three-year uh, agreement coming up. And um, I know this is a lot of information, but knowing that you'd have a handout, we wanted to be able to provide it to you so that you could see actually all of the concessions agreements, who their subcontractor or rather their ACDBE partners are, what the original solicitation goal is, 
what the accepted goal is, and how we're faring. So, you know, there's, there's very little red there, which is very nice. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. I'm just, for except, trying to understand these columns, solicitation goal, uh, accept goal, and participation. Mm -hmm. Where it says local concept food members, pasta house, story channel, concession group, uh, solicitation will accept 14%, and it says participation 100%. What does 100% mean? Meaning that for the pasta house, that uh, when the goal was set, you have no idea okay. who might. Be awarded that so the goal was set based upon the availability of firms who could deliver food and service so that goal was 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 developed and that was in the solicitation who responded to that and was awarded that contract is an ACDBE and they are 100% so therefore the participation is counted and all those dollars are counted at 100% those are the kinds of arrangements that make a difference in our achievements and they and the pasta house partnered with them kind of as a franchisee and they do that so uh, they have both of the pasta houses here in terminal one and terminal two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the very bottom line number, the it, our ACDB goal that uh, we have registered with FAA that we're benchmarked for these past three years is at 25.29%. And our participation achievement, back to some of those, um, those same types of scenarios where you have a prime, is at 32.38%. So we are running well above um, the actual um, goal that was established. Which means we'll continue to see federal funding come our way. Right, <laughs> very much, because they do, they, they track those very, very, very closely. All right, uh, car rental is, not, not everybody also realizes that, that car rentals are a concession, and it is a very different, different animal. So our goal for ACDB car rental is at 1.60%. Now, some people might gasp and so forth, but I can actually tell you that this is pretty norm across the United States. Um, I have been on the board for AMAC and continuing to work with them as a part of a smaller group and other people have to, and looking at the car rental industry and trying to work with FAA to, um, to be able to make some changes. We've got great car rental companies I can tell you that the, the size standards and the requirements and the lower thresholds, for instance, personal net worth and, um, and also uh, gross revenues keep a lot of companies, minority and women owned companies, for instance, in car dealerships, which is the main purchase. I don't want to speak for one of our commissioners, but he could probably say who comes from that industry. But, um, you know, when you look at where the purchases are and where you can get participation for car rental, it's going to be in petroleum, it's going to be in car dealerships, and the fact of it is, is that government, really regulations have not kept pace with, unfortunately, um, net worth requirements and so forth. So what, um, across the board in airports, this is about what we're seeing, it's still sizable numbers that are going to it, but in other industries, some of these firms, they just simply aren't able to participate and work with us because they can't get certified because the thresholds are too low. And we should give a shout out, and I'm not doing this for Sean, but probably Enterprise is the most active within the aviation industry to try and change that number. So uh, kudos to Enterprise for doing that. Not to you, Sean, but to Enterprise as well. You're a Right. So now, I, I, we knew that there might be some questions about the, the new ordinance that was passed. I think it was signed uh, June 4th by our mayor. So it's the City of St. Louis Ordinance 70767. So I wanted to provide you a quick overview of the breakout of what the ordinance will cover as the goals and some of the key programs that emerged in the new program. So as we've traditionally reported, um, MBE has been an all-encompassing um, um, umbrella title to include African American, Hispanic, Asian, Native American individuals. The new disparity study outlined a need for the city to adopt a policy that would break those out. So when it, when we look at construction contracts, for instance, and this will be probably also I think for service as well, um, that. The, the goals are broken out more distinctly among the various ethnicities. 
there is a what is called a bid discount program that's included um, in this uh, program recommendation and it's on two levels one for construction and one for goods and services so one of the recommendations that the consultants made was when they looked at the patterns for purchasing across the city this just wasn't for the airport but for all of the city departments was that there was a large really i guess uh, number of dollars that were being awarded among a very few number of firms. So one of the things we wanted to do was to help sort of break that out and so forth. So what was recommended was that they look at that we have for contracts, when you are bidding as a prime, if any of you are bidding as a prime, that they actually be awarded a 5% discount on their bid price, as long as the projection for the cost of that project would be under 300,000. Strategies like this, what, it, what, what they're meant to do is to help it to encourage and to facilitate uh, minority women-owned firms into being primes and hopefully also in terms of them bidding with each other. It doesn't restrict the big boys from bidding and so forth, but it gives them additional tool to help them out in terms of, of <coughs> what they bid. And it caps it at 300000 the last component, major component of the program will be an, uh, a, an evaluation process for professional services. Uh, evaluation points will be given 15 points in a 100 point uh, grading system or point evaluation for professional services. I was down at SLDC earlier today and we were talking about some of these. Um, this is a component we are working with the consultants and getting their directives as to how to best implement this and I'm sure the city will be putting forth something very soon that will provide much more detail to the implementation of the new program but I would be remiss if I didn't um, at least provide you all with an overview of what the new program will look like so with that I'm glad to take any questions or comments mm -hmm. Mine is a comment, so if I think I was the one who asked for You this. did, uh, thank you. <laughs> this was so much more helpful than just getting the report, because you know, we would have had questions. Um, and as we, you know, approve contracts and we kind of tick and tack mm -hmm. what the NDEWBE participation is, I would have never expected it to be this significant. So congratulations to you, I guess congratulations to us. For pushing on this, but uh, this is really, I mean, this, this is stellar. Great. Well, we got a great team here, and we take it very seriously, and there's always a conscious effort in everything we're doing to ensure how, how these contracts are falling out. Any other? Yes, sir. Just say, I'm very excited to see the prime contract portion at the back here. Um, I was just discussing with a friend of mine on the run this morning, um, about how the You did. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, I don't think, I think we under um, estimate the value of what it is to see the list of representing us and the fact that the whole industry knows her as an expert and go to personally. And we uh, were working on our, our white paper to address some of the challenges that we see in, in firms becoming ACP qualified in our space. And we were right there through the entire process. And uh, I just saw her two weeks ago in Seattle. Well, thank you. We're not giving up on the car rental stuff. We agree with that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amber. Thank That's you great. very much. Um, while we change out here, uh, Linda Martinez is with us, and she's going to give us some updates on the privatization. A couple things while they're setting up that presentation. We did get a Moody's upgrade. Well, everybody saw that uh, Moody's upgraded this to an A2, so we were excited about that. Very good reports there. Uh, we were upheld with uh, S&P, upheld our rating. Uh, so not an upgrade, but they did up a little bit, and that actually, uh, they changed their whole way of rating, so most people have seen downgrades this year, so we were able to hold on with them, which was exciting. Still waiting for the Fitch, which we anticipate out in another week or two. Uh, just a little bit, uh, we made an announcement with Southwest as well. So starting next spring, at least on Saturdays, uh, similar to what they did with Cancun, they're also gonna fly Montego Bay and Punta Cana, so two more international destinations. 
If it's successful, I think we'll, we'll see that a little longer. But in addition to that, they're going to bring back West Palm Beach and Charleston, South Carolina for the season, which is good. We had that last year. That's coming back. During the week, they've added daily service to five additional markets, Sacramento, San Jose, Hartford, which they just put in. They're putting a second one in, Philadelphia, and D.C. And then on weekends, uh, they're adding additional service to Fort Myers, Nashville, uh, Detroit, and uh, Orlando. So uh, it's a pretty uh, significant amount of seats added into our schedule uh, starting next spring. They are anticipating the bulk of that is going to come through connecting traffic again. So we got the uh, July numbers, uh, the August numbers, uh, no, July. Uh, and we, we saw a 4.5% increase. We did see a local increase of 3.7, which was about 21,000 passengers. Uh, well, brought in about 4,500 of those, uh, which was a nice, but we also saw other increases on the local market. The connecting traffic uh, was up 7.6% as well. So continuing to see that climb, so that's a good story. Uh, a fun Build-A-Bear day out here today. So Build-A-Bear uh, partnered with Southwest across the country. And I don't know the exact number of airports, but they selected their larger airports and they picked a flight and everyone on the flight got a bear, whether you were an 80 year old or a one year old. So Jeff and I went down, Rob was there with us. Uh, really fun, they, they picked a 10, 20 flight. Maxine Clark was out, Sharon Price was out. Sharon actually went on the flight with them. To Dallas because they're going to do a headquarters uh, event thanking Build a Bear. Uh, so it was fun to have Maxine and, and uh, Sharon out here. People loved it. There was, I think there were only two children actually on the flight, <laughs> uh, but it was a full flight and you, you looked at the gate area and you saw people wearing Build a Bear and Adams and little teddy bears. So uh, it was kind of fun. Uh, so that was our event today. And then uh, just to kind of give one quick update uh, on the cleaning contract, we we did enter and approve through ENA, we could go two weeks ago now, uh, an extension on the emergency contract for 18 months uh, with the current contractor Regency. So uh, that uh, is going into effect, I guess yesterday, October 1st, and uh, whatever day it is, I lost track of days this week. Uh, and with that, uh, they have, I think, a 90 day window, we will be bringing, they will be bringing on a sub uh, for flooring to help out with the flooring. So we gave them 90 days to work through that and we'll work with them on, on appropriate sub. So that's where we're at on the cleaning contract. So it has now been extended for 18 months. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda and she's gonna kind of give us an update here. Good afternoon. You may have seen me walking back and forth. I, I just saw that I needed 35 steps. Rhonda asked me to come and make a presentation to give you an update on where we are with the, uh, the working group. And the, the short answer is we're just really at the very beginning. I know you've been hearing about the potential for airport for the, uh, privatization, the exploration of airport privatization here in November for a year and a half. And we really just signed the contract and had the very first two meetings of the working group last month. Although the Davis is on the working group, Rhonda's on the working group. Uh, the group of seven of, uh, seven of us, and uh, we've had just three meetings this last uh, month, and I want to give you a little bit of an update of, of the process that we're going to undergo and utilize in order to do the exploration. So if you review the materials that the working group got in, at the meetings, I apologize in advance. This is a subset of what we, uh, we as a working group, reviewed um, at our meetings in, in August. Can you hear me okay here? <laughs> so, um, the just to kind of go over what our goals were, this, these are the items that were set forth in the original application that was made to the FAA, and this is the goals for the exploration process, to identify and deliver the best options to the city, and think about what can we do to generate meaningful proceeds. Now, this doesn't mean that the, the, the transaction would ultimately go forward, but it's just to have an exploration that, that results in that opportunity to be available, to be considered by the Board of Aldermen and the leadership of the city. What could we do? Also number two, uh, that's a, sort of within the, one of the things that I would say, uh, the business community respects a lot of concerns about. So all the proceeds would go into the airport. How much would go into the airport versus how much would go into the city? Um, that is an excellent question, and I think part of it is to have a, a, maybe a better understanding of what privatization does, because 
things to go into the airport would be things that w would be that the air the city and the airport would want to have go into the airport, and the the operator could could make those uh, opportunities available. Uh, could be re reduction in in landing fees. It could be other things that make the uh, utilization of the airport uh, able to be increased or make opportunities for other airlines, et cetera. So there would be a lot of things that would be explored during this process. So it could be you know physical elements to the airport over 50 years or 40 years or 30 years of a lease. There'd be a lot of capital needs that the airport would have and how would those be allocated and paid for by a potential operator. Those would all be things that would be taken into consideration so that the airport would be refreshed and, and expanded or so you're going to take hundred percent of the proceeds. How much do you just give us a ballpark? Would eighty percent go to the airport, or what's? what's I don't think that there's any anybody has any fixed uh, elements on that. I mean, first thing that would be done would be payment in full of all of the airport related debt. So that that, that would be the the first and major part of the of the uh, the use of any meaningful proceeds. Okay. For clarity. And this is what I say to my public when I'm talking to my community. At the end of the day, the FAA is the oversight for the, the, not only the air traffic safety, but the infrastructure of the airport. So if we did come up with something really ignorant, they're not going to let it go through anyway. So we, the airport is always protected, always. So it, we don't get to just make crazy decisions on our own. Uh, that oversight will always be there. It never goes away. But it's no defined number. Uh, it couldn't necessarily be a defined number now because as we watch, as we operate here, different things come up that need to be done. You also have a five-year uh, plan that they put in place. And so those kinds of things will all go into consideration. Mm -hmm. And again, we have the FIA there to make sure that we don't skirt any of those mandatory things that need to take place. Okay. And I think one of the other things- And airlines, of course. Yeah. I mean, At this point in time, uh, we don't have operating standards for this airport. And so as part of the process that we're talking about is actually having written standards. How clean does the airport have to be? What do you have to do with regard to lighting? What do you have to do with regard to employment? What do you have to do with regard to services? And so we don't have written standards. Yeah, I don't want to keep pushing that, but it is interesting that the second one is meaningful proceeds to the city, and the next one is improvement mm -hmm. against the airport. Well, I don't, they're not in order of importance, but I think the mayor has said many times, and I'll repeat it here, if we don't have a better airport at the end of this transaction, it doesn't matter how much money is, is involved, we will not do it. Yeah, and I think just for people that aren't familiar with it, I just don't want to screw the issue that there would be of some sort of funds that would not go to the airport, right? Mm -hmm. It's not defined how much, because mm -hmm. we don't know yet, but I think it's safe to say that there would be a portion of X number that would be um, not put back to the airport. Is that a that's, that's, that's a fair you know, opportunity and li limitation. And the other thing about that, though, is right now, airlines don't have uh, ways to be sure what their expenses are going to be in the future. And this would have an opportunity to let them be able to have a more certain future with regard to their expenses. So there, there's pluses and minuses everywhere, and which is why we're exploring this. But at the end, all of those things will have to be thoughtfully balanced. And, uh, and the analysis will be very challenging, and uh, but give us an opportunity to hopefully have a lot of thoughtful data to, to consider as, as we as the Board of Alder makes a decision, the leadership makes a decision, the FAA makes a decision, the airlines make a decision. Is this meaning, meaningful proceeds for the city and the committee? Is it being viewed as a region? Oh, or is all this money going to the city and to the airport? Well, Would the St. Louis County be involved, or Madison County, or St. Charles County? That's part of the exploration process. <laughs> And then I, I, that was right on. I, I'm not sure if you're going to go through this and you're on slide one. I'm not sure how many slides you have in my group. 
Uh, I, I shouldn't have been. I just, no, it's okay. No, it's a good point. It's in people's minds. So it's yeah. just proceed. I, I, no, I think it's a really good point, though, and that is understanding uh, the process that the city's defined on how they're going to determine the use of the meaningful proceeds. Are you going to go through that mm -hmm. today? Okay. A little bit. I mean, we're at this point in time, we're really – like I said, at, a ver at the very beginning, but one of the important parts of what we're going to do, and I will, we'll talk a bit of this later, after we go through the process of, of, you know, what's the baseline information about the airport? And that's what we're talking about here. Questions that we're going to look at during the process. You know, how are we currently performing? What could, you know, what would the value of the airport be? And how could we better serve? And this, I think, is what we're talking about in terms of the region. If the airport could better serve the city, the region, the public, the airlines, the entire, you know, all other counties, St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Illinois, et cetera. Um, in order to evaluate that, we've, um, and, and these are some of the things you've already heard about, but obviously other airports across the world have explored this and come to a, a thoughtful balance here, but, and, and the, the uh, if it wasn't for the crash, market crash, Midway would be a privatized airport. And uh, San Juan is a privatized airport. And I'm sorry, Linda, what did you say if it wasn't for? The crash oh, back in 2009. So, and significant portions of airports are currently under private operation. I mean, if you think about this airport, significant, you know, Alderwin is absolutely right. There's a lot of private operations. Security is privatized. Concessions are privatized. Uh, cleaning is privatized. You know, a lot of the other concessions that, that uh, make this airport a, a, a wonderful opportunity and, and, uh, and a, an asset to the region are privatized. So it's, it's a thoughtful balance between public and private right now. So we have uh, divided up into six different work streams in order to evaluate this. And like I said, we're really at the very first month. Airport diligence has really fallen on Rhonda, Mario, and their team. Um, the uh, uh, putting up a lot, of, putting a lot of information to the data room. I'll talk about that later. And, and Alderwoman Davis is involved in the community outreach reach and communications. I think that's really going to be where we talk to other people in the region, St. Louis County, Flying Public, etc. Uh, new use agreements, lease, and FAA. I'm on that team. Market Gerard Hollins, who works for the Board of Aldermen, and existing debt and finance, Jim Garvalia, and Mark uh, Michael Garvin are. Uh, Deputy City Councilor is on legal. So a little bit deeper, and we can get you these slides. Airport diligence is really populated in a data room. It's very similar to other financings, getting all the relevant documents up into the data room. And, and like I said, Rhonda and our team have been doing above and beyond when it comes to getting that work done. Then we have community outreach and communications. And we have just reviewed the phase one plan on this. and. Uh, Alderwoman Davis will be looking at this in more detail, but right now we're just really talking to the, what I would refer to as the owners of the airport, the citizens of the city of St. Louis, but that's just the very first part of this. You know, we're really going to have to spend a lot of time talking to the flying public, the corporate community, uh, other companies, airport uh, service providers, airport employees, vendors, everybody on, on the entire spectrum because, you know, what can we do to make this a better airport and a better uh, catalyst for economic development in the region it needs to be fully vetted and explored. And what can we do with proceeds in order to make that happen? Our regular briefings with the Board of Aldermen and the committees. And like I said, we are at this point in time just working on community outreach in the city. And that's just the very first step. There'll be a lot more um, outreach in the future. Um, new use agreements and uh, lease with the, uh, the airport and communications with the FAA. We had a meeting in July and they were um, said everything was on track in terms of their process but they wanted to know where the overall timing was and I'll get to that later slide. Uh, the existing airline use agreement expires, as you all know, in 2021. The idea would be that a separate use agreement would be discussed with the airlines to see what would happen in a <coughs> private scenario. And that would be a separate process while making sure that we're not having any adverse impact 
on the existing arrangements and the existing operations of the airport. Existing concession agreements and other agreements, you probably have already seen some of them be have a one and two year extension rather than a multi five, 10, 15 year extension because we want to see what is possible in the, uh, as in the exploration process. And if other new agreements are signed, we want to make sure that they work under either the continuing the existing situation or a potential lease in the future. Um, the market uh, exploration will probably be mostly during next year. This is the overall schedule. So right now we're, we're in a data gathering phase. We're talking to people, community outreach. Uh, as I said, Ron and her team are working on the data room and we're in the initial conversations about how the overall process will occur. The, most of the work will be done next year. And if this goes forward, we could be talking about uh, getting bids towards the end of next year and making decisions towards the end of next year. For the whole time, the city retains full authority to decide to stop pursuit of this exploration or to continue going forward and you know, at the, at the end make it the final decision as we talked about. Um, existing debt and finances being considered, but this has no impact on the proposed uh, refinancing that's being considered next year. Just keep operating in your airport exactly the way you're doing now and uh, move things forward. Legal compliance is a typical thing. It's one of our, the important things that's in our guiding, we have a set of guiding principles to, to, to direct our actions and one of them is, is to do something especially good in terms of inclusion and diversity in all of our activities and make sure that we are not only during the process but um, um, should a, a privatization go forward, should a lease, long term lease go forward, that we continue to meet and exceed our goals. I know there's, that there's a lot of questions out there and to be perfectly honest, you know, we, like I said, we are, this is the first month in this process. We have a, a lot of um, good people advising us, people who worked on Midway, people who worked on San Juan, people who have worked on, on long-term leases uh, in other countries, worked with the FAA. We have, you know, very smart people. I know there's a lot of stories out there about new consultants being brought on and one of the things that's good about that for us is we're getting the very best talent to help us evaluate this opportunity, this option. And uh, it does not change the, 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 the terms of our arrangement with our consulting team. If they add three more consultants, it, it's like a, I, I don't mean to be as simplistic as this, but it's like a real estate sales contract. We have a fixed price for the entire transaction. And the more people that help us, it is at no additional cost to the city in the exploration. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, thank you so much. The question that I keep getting asked that I can't answer is, what is the approval process? Who has the day made? Is it the mayor? Is it the board of DNA? Is it the board of aldermen? What's the role of the commission? Those are the questions I just have not been able to answer. And, it, you know, it makes me feel a little bit stupid as a commissioner to not be able to answer that. Agreed. A long-term lease of, of city property requires approval by the board of aldermen, uh, and it requires approval by the DNA and would require approval um, by the mayor to sign any legislation. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a significant amount of community engagement in that process. But um, in addition to the internal city processes, as the alderman brings up, the uh, FAA and the you know Department of Transportation will look at this transaction and see. They will actually conduct a hearing and make sure that they get the community input. People are putting comments on the website now. Um, most of them are negative, I'll be perfectly yeah. honest. Um, I, and, and that part I understand. I understand yeah. the engagement part of it. And the other, oh, because I think you've answered, DNA, Alderman, Mayor is part of DNA. Mm -hmm. I guess the other question is the airlines. I have heard yes. that the airlines have a Absolutely. 65, and, and it's two, two tests. 65% of the carriers that service this airline and carriers that uh, handle 65% of the, the, the weight landed. Right, it's two ways. They look at landed weight and they look at passenger employments. 
So if you look at obviously Southwest, our largest carrier, at 56% of the total employments at this airport, you could not do it without their approval at the end of the day. And then you'd have to have 65% in total with all the other carriers combined. That's the most, those are the most direct answers yes. I've ever gotten. So yes. I really appreciate it, because now, again, people have asked you, and now we can answer. Yes. Uh, the answer is the commission really has no right. role on that. Now, obviously, you know, you, I think that, that in, a, in a new world, if that is, comes to be, and I don't think it's, you know, if we have any knowledge of whether that's going to happen or not, I think having community input, having business leadership input, having regional input is going to be integral to the process. And so I've always thought, and I know I'm not the only person who thinks to make these decisions, that a board such as this would be, you know, would continue to operate in the new world as as the as the as the way to communicate. We have to have some oversight, otherwise we have to have somebody who's monitoring the police, but I'm also thinking, you know, more in terms of proactive and, and community engagement as opposed to just are you do are your floors clean enough pursuant to the operating standards. I think it'd have to be, you know, is this something that, that the community thinks is important? You know, I think there would have to be a methodology for communicating not just the city of St. Louis, but the entire region. I think I think with the um, you know set aside being on the commission is the process in which the airport is going about how they're going to figure out what to do with the best proceeds or however that was defined. It's really understanding, okay, I understand that, that you have to go into the this huge approval process. The RFP on this is going to be excruciating, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, probably already know some sort of number and I've been hearing the value of the airport and I'm assuming that it just keeps going up the great job Ron and his, her team are doing is that if the number is worth a million dollars you know and a portion of that is going to be taken out of the airport how is the city going about or the region going about the process of evaluating what to do with those proceeds and you mentioned things like paying off the debt so certainly there's some sort of list or thought process that's been to go through that, it would just be nice to, to uh, understand. Um, Bill will really not help me on this, maybe if I have to help you, but I think at this point in time, it's premature to start thinking about one, how much it's going to be, and two, how the money will be spent. And the working group is not assigned to the task, yeah. but they make the determination of how the funds, any funds might be expended. Um, it's, it's uh, we're trying to just make the, the opportunity something that's fully explored and vetted in a thoughtful way and bring the opportunity back to the decision makers. We're not, you know, I think, you know, if you look at a consulting agreement, it does call for us to go out and get the information about what people in the region, what people in the city would like the funds to be spent on. But the city has a, an existing list of, and methodology for determining capital needs and what those are and what the priorities are. And, but that doesn't mean that that's where the money would be spent. Uh, the, the consulting agreement calls for us to take the temperature of the, the citizens in the region about how they think we should, the money should be spent. But the ultimate decision makers on that would be the same people that make the decision on the ultimate you know, approval of the lease. Is this the way the, the money should be spent? Is that connected, though? Is, oh. it, is, it, is it connected, meaning that before the city would engage <coughs> into a contract, they would have a plan? There's some people that are really think that we need um, big reserves and, and how we, you know, it's going to be every day, we're one day closer to a recession. So how are we you know, making sure that we're resilient as a city? Um, are the things that we could do that would change the cost of operating? So, you know, a lot of people use IT better than we do. Maybe that's an opportunity. But also, are the things that, like a transportation system that better connects us to the airport? Would that be something that would be, some people would be interested? You know, we are, we're tasked with asking people what they think would be good uses of proceeds, but the city has an existing system for its big capitals by the church, and we would not be the ones to make any decisions on it as the working group. And we want to want to misguide people on this process, and I'm probably the loudest mouth because I, anytime anybody starts talking about that, I shut them down because we don't have enough data, we don't have enough information. 
we just started putting this together as far as the working part of it. So until you gather enough data to understand where you are, or if this even makes sense to go any further than the exploration part of it, we should not be putting numbers out there because we don't know, and that would be wrong. Also, the forecast too, looking at the economic forecast for the future of our country is also another thing for us to be concerned about. Because right now, everything that I'm reading and everything that people are saying, we could very well be in another recession in a year. Uh, so what, how would we look if we propose something, have people expecting it, and then you can't deliver? So let's, let's do our due diligence first and see where we are. Uh, and as you said, it is going to be connected. When we look at the ways and means, when we're looking at the budget of the city of St. Louis, when we're looking at the needs of the airport, all of those things have to be considered with reality. And that's the other part that I don't deal with over there, where people hypothesize. I have to deal with reality. So I want to see all of that. And this is a good time to be working on your projections anyway. And so as we're pulling this data, uh, the, the true facts will be there for us, and we can make a better decision. So uh, a lot of people believe things have been decided, and maybe they have been somewhere, but not in front of me. Okay, uh, and I'm not going to let it happen. So we're, we got a lot of work to do, and we want to be very responsible. With it. Yeah, I'm just more curious about the defining process of, mm -hmm. uh, of how the city's going to go about and things that I have. About. And I think we'll be able to send that out to the public very shortly. Um, the, the first phase of communication. First phase of yeah. First phase of communication. Yeah. And then after that, we're going to be working on, because I think they're still bringing on another consultant, because um, we all disagreed on that last Friday, who's going to be helping pull this data together. It's really a, a key part of it. Uh, and so once we get all those pieces in place, then we can look at the timeline for when you'll be, where we'll be in the process. And we need to put that out to the public. Uh, maybe a question for the community on the side. In terms of how to use the funds, 
we are going to do that exploration. But the working group is not the group that makes the decisions. And we don't want to create expectations and, and almost presuppose an outcome by, because people get so enamored with what the money might buy. And so we want to make sure we go through the process Absolutely. and not say, you know, that there's this bright, shiny toy without being thoughtful about, you know, there's lots of other pieces to this. And it, it could be that we could spend the money in, in very important ways, but decide not to, to lease the airport. And we don't want to create expectations in people's minds about, you know, a different, a different future if we decide not to. So I'm not sure to really answer my question. <laughs> I, think, I think what Josh is asking is ultimately the only reason for doing something is because you have an end game in mind of what you want to do. So we have X project, or we need X amount of money, and we're trying to get there. This may be an outlet for us to get there. Well, so I'm, if I'm understanding you, I think that's what, and I. I just want to know if there's a parallel with the cities that are based or bases today that gives someone like me comfort that we're going down this process how much money is out there, and then we'll just go figure that out. Well, this particular process, absolutely not. That's pretty sure. And I don't, and that's the other part, too. We don't talk about this the right way. They know I've been beating up on everybody. I can't have my advisors over here talking about the end, when we don't know what the end is. And I don't care if the, what you, you would like for the end to be. I don't want it talked about as though a decision has been made because it hasn't. And it can't be until we have more information. Yes, the expectation would be to see if we could garner more profit if it's managed a different way. But if, if the results say no, then there's no reason to go any further. If the results say yes, then that's when you start looking at how much that is, how how that's going to happen. Create an art. Um, we should do an RFQ first, and, and, and then an RFP. And, and, and maybe we have somebody who wants to make off. But again, all the people who are swarming around now, talking about what all they can do, they don't know anything. They don't have any data before them. They know nothing. I'm just going to tell you the truth. They know nothing. So they're just assuming, based on the fact that they know what was done in Chicago, and they know what was done in San Juan. San Juan. San Juan. But the other back part of that is the majority of the international airports are privately managed. And so there are a lot of assumptions that come from that part as well that people are looking at. So you've got a lot of things that have to be considered. But at the end of the day, it's really about our idol, what we can do. No matter what has happened anywhere else, we have to have our facts to work with. And it's going to be complicated. We're all going to be a little crazy by the end. Um, I already see that coming. And I've been through processes like this before, uh, dealing with the school board. Um, we settled the DSED case. That was a nightmare. You deal with 27 different uh, municipalities and lawyers, at the end of the day, adding our lawyers, it was 40 of them. I had to cut $85 million out of the budget in order to continue to run the system. And it was just a litany of things you had to deal with all at once. That's what we got. And that's what we're going to be doing. But we're going to be responsible. Or I'm out. So we're going to be responsible. What I'm really most excited about you know, that's you know, different than what we're doing now is can we do Joining the airport differently than we do now. There's a lot of limitations that come with tax and then a lot of things that uh, has been a barrier to, uh, to transactions and barriers to uh, pricing requirements for the FAA, etc. If you know, if we're in a different environment and mode and don't have tax and then lot transactions to, to burden the use of the property joining the airport, can we do something that's extraordinary? that creates jobs in a way that we've never done before. I mean, to me, the regional economic development opportunities are really something that has to be considered, and it's not even factored into, you know, the, the money part or the process part. Everybody keeps talking about, you know, advisors and how much people are being paid, and, and you know, we 
haven't gotten far enough along in the process, but what are the opportunities? And are they worth the cost? I mean, I think it's going to take us you know, a good 16, 18 months to get to that point in time, but I'm looking forward to finding out can we bring something to the airport that we've never been able to do before? Can we use that land? And there's a lot of it over there in a totally different way that changes the trajectory of our own city and our future. I didn't see anywhere in the timeline. Oh, sorry, there wasn't. No, 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 that's there the was report you just okay. described. Here's the report that says, here are the criteria on whether this would make sense for the city and our region. Here are the, here are the criteria, the 5, 10, 20, whatever criteria, and here is line by line. And here's why, here's what we think, whether privatization can do something better than the city. When is that report out? When, when does that come out? Uh, that would probably be around uh, quarter two or quarter three of next year. But that's, you've already got, sorry, to the qualification, qualification and bidding process. I'm just saying, when does the report come out that says, we should, you know, here's the data we have, and all the women and all the women and mayor, and then you make a decision. Does this make sense to go forward or not? Where, you know, where is, where is that in there? The, uh, so whether or not the decision to issue the RQ, the first step, right. would be Q1 next year. And the report and look at the report, and, and we would have access because we have public document mm -hmm. to say. Actually, probably you would, some of it would not be public because it would be in you know, very uh, confidential financial projections and models and assumptions that would that could affect the credit rating of the city, the airport, the, the region, and I think. Well, RFQ? Yeah, the, the data. Oh, uh, the data, yeah. The data, the oh, background okay. data. Well, there'll be some version of the yeah, report, but we can all see yeah. to say, yeah, this makes sense because this is something that privatization could do above and beyond what we can do as a city or as a region. Uh, and I'm guessing there'll be recommendations in that report to say, if you decide not to go with privatization, here's some things we recommend the airport do anyway uh, in, in order to up, up our game here. Because mm -hmm. right? it's always good to get an outside look and outside mm -hmm. audit and things like that. Is that. So is there a date on that in quarter one? Uh, I don't know that, I, I, we don't, we haven't gotten used to the detail of that, but the first 60 days of detail we've got in the first six months. Because it would be nice to see that as its own sub-bullet 2.1 of uh, here's the date of the report, or here's the, the time frame, and here's where the, the these bodies we have made this decision have to review, and then share with the public the public comment period to say, here's the look we've had behind this, you know, group of consultants, here's what they're saying. So uh, just something like that would be beneficial. Well, uh, very early on, we'll be doing an we'll be doing an analysis of the airport and how to compare to uh, parking vessels. And are those criteria laid out anywhere before you even start this to say we're going to evaluate this, 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 and this? Six, ten, twenty, thirty things. So we can see are, are these the right criteria to make this decision or not? I think it, it's more, it's not a criteria to make a decision, it's just, it's a benchmarking process. And if the benchmarking shows that we're, we're redlining it, and we're, you know, top of our, our game, and we're, you know, there's nothing we can improve, then nothing that a private group, potential lessee could bring to the table. If there are things that we can improve, that, you know, we're in the middle of the road, or we're not as high as we'd like to be, those would be things that we would ask, you know, and look those are things we can fix ourselves with. Potentially. Right. And part of it is, is the limitations of the kind of financing that we have and our own credit rating. So, can I ask a question? Um, when we do this comparison, are there going to be any comparison to um, airport authorities? Uh, because airport authorities are very common and successful in the United States, opposed to internationally. Um, they are a quasi governmental agency and they take a, a lot of those bureaucratic. Uh, blocking, as you would put it, out of the way. So when they compare that to our competitors, they're going to compare that to just municipal-run airports or airports that have become airport authority independent boards, where this board would be an advisory in nature, but the board would actually be a true airport appointed by the mayor and other public officials. So are we going to look at that? I mean, Indianapolis, Dallas, there's, there's a lot of successful airports that are run by airport authority, true airport authorities. And do you know if that will be compared to that's something that should be looked at because I'm sure that uh, part of the success 
if that was the decision, would be the structure of how you operate. Mm -hmm. And you would probably need, a, 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 as you said, an authority that could really make some decisions on that level without having a lot of bureaucratic. But see, like right now, it has to come through the Transportation Committee, the Board of Aldermen, the full Board of Aldermen, and e and Right. But I think what, what John was asking was on a comparison, because if you look at the privatization, it would not be a full no, it, it would be an entity in its, it's, it's own. Right, right. So I think the, the thought that John was asking is on the comparison that you look at, because there's a big difference between Fort Mon Airport or the 40 airports versus a city owned airport in that structure. So. I mean, you still have a quasi government agency, uh, but you have a lot of the independence that takes out the bureaucracy, even the levels of procurement and you know, things like that. Well, even if you look at the operations as far as the, the numbers of uh, airlines of service and all that. Uh, six months ago, our numbers were very different than what they are today, based on what's just happened in the last six months. So that's why you can't project anything today. That would just that would just be criminal to do that. And so we need to wait till we have all the data that is more current, closer to the process time limit of after expiration of all other operations. But that's the other point of that. Because it's basically we just want an operational audit, like companies do all the time. I would agree with you, and that, that answers my question that yeah. we're going to compare to all types of run airports, not just city run airports. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. the, I mean, it, it, there's a tremendous difference, and there's a reason that a lot of cities have gone to airport authorities so they can work on economic development. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Slide. And if there are things that, you know, if your decision is not to lease, and that could very well be the case things that we can bring back, you know, all of us thinking hopefully of people who are running airports throughout the entire world, how, what they, would they do? And, and then the question is, how do we find all the they ask for? I'm, I'm looking forward to learning through the entire process about what we do is about to be a better city, a better region, a better airport. Yeah, this one, so if we're looking at, say we lease it, because we can do A, B, C, D, that the airport can't do today. Are we looking at what we have to do to change A, B, C, D, and E so the airport can be? As opposed to just leasing? Oh, for sure. Yeah. We're going to have a baseline of where we are today and then the private model will come and then we do A, B, C, D. I mean, you mentioned yeah. earlier the land out here is something we can't do because of timing or whatever. How do we change that so we can do it at the airport? Not at the least. And some of that's just as we, as we pay the bonds down. Some of the bonds right now are restricted for private use, public use only. So as we pay more and more of the debt down, that frees up more of the land for us going forward to be able to do some of those things. We are a little bit restricted right now just because of the outstanding debt and how the bonds were sold. So as we pay down, you know, next year we got a fairly large refunding again, uh, which we're hoping to do based on the, the rates right now. They were pretty good to continue to go with that process. So as we get more of the debt paid down, it does free up more of that land that's currently restricted to allow us to do other things with. Is that something that you help the commission with on the mm -hmm. line, kind of what our debt is and break it down? Oh, sure. You know, I, I think we've seen some of that before as yeah. to when certain things are going to retire. Sure. Um, sure. It would be more of a commission for us so that we understand. Yeah. I can put them on the next one. Sure. Well, and maybe some of the limitations that FAA has in the bond have. I'm sorry. What is our debt program? About 670. And we have 190 million coming from Paul that we can refund in uh, early next spring. It's actually it's 595 million, and uh, yeah, it's 90 million refunding next year. They're building the same restrictions. We well, yeah. know. And the FAA you know, has restrictions that say you can't release right. least for less than the cost. So in, in a lot of these not development models,
in lieu of a master plan, we're, we're going to do a, an AELP, so it's an air, air, airfield, airport layout plan. Uh, we worked with the FAA, um, and, and again, this was the advisory group saying that they felt a, a full master plan would be a little bit contradictory right now if you're looking at trying to uh, go through this process and you know people being confused about why you're doing the master plan if you're looking at this. So what we looked at at the airport was what things were most critical to us in this master plan, and that's the forecast. It was the airfield. It was a, a detailed sort of facilities look at our existing facilities. And then the road, and the road, the roadway in front. Uh, right, that would be called the facility would include the terminals. Uh, and then the roadway uh, in front of Terminal 2. So uh, we, uh, we got an OK from the FAA that they would agree to fund the ALP versus the master plan, and that RFP should be going out here sometime in the next week or so. Uh, well, it's about an 18 month process. Right, Jerry? Yes, once we have a contract. Once we have a contract, so it'll be. Yeah, it probably takes us six close months to a year contract. to have a contract actually in place and notice we're seeing the whole cycle. How long does that? I mean, if we get, let's say we go all the way through this and then privatization is moving right after doing that, then how long will the FAA have until you have to do the formal 10 year lookout plan? Does this buy us another 10 years or buy us a couple of years? I think that depends on the funding cycles and what it is. Uh, so, you know, everything is driven by the, because <clears throat> that master plan is funded at 75 25. You know, you're talking several million dollars to do one of these. Uh, so I think that we, we talked about this scenario with them when we were looking at revising it from a full master plan to uh, an airport layout plan. And, you know, it, it's clear that it would be on the funding cycles. So uh, uh, I mean, all of this stuff that we are looking at in the airport layout plan that we're proposing would have been part of the master plan. So that piece will take a look at a further forecast. I think we look at Jerry at 15 or 20, I don't remember. 15 or 20, I'm sorry. In the, in the ALP, does it take a look really at our needs for the next 15 to 20 years or 10? It would forecast that it's still 20 years 20 in terms of employments and so on. Uh, but, you know, to put it in perspective, Commissioner, the, the last master plan was completed in 2012 with the ALP update approved in January of 2013. So it probably keeps us whole in that sense for, you know, six to eight years. And if, you know, if the, the, the exploration was abandoned, I, you know, I don't know to say, but you know, the ALP is, appears based on pricing to be 8%, 9% of a total master plan. So it could be that you would, you know, engage and have the, the balance of the activities that, that would constitute a master plan. It's not that they consume their out. Well, I ask because, you know, we've already talked about, you know, extending versus rebating some of these contracts and we kind of feel like a lot of hidden costs that the airport may have to bear because we've created this period of uncertainty. Um, so everyone kind of says, oh, well, this is free, you can look free, things like that. But there are costs being borne by the airport and the city by making all these decisions because we have this cloud of uncertainty that's, that's been created that we can't make decisions on and now we're postponing and we're pushing out and stacking up additional work down the road for you know now we go to bid now we have to do now we put a master plan and I, I just just kind of feels like you know there's a lot of stuff that, that isn't being seen that is happening um, in terms of costs and other things here. So that's just my comment. Okay. Um, the ALP update is pretty common at this time frame anyway. I, I completely agree with what you're saying about others, like if I'm not the bidding project. But from an ALP update, get fundable projects. Uh, this makes all the sense in the world. And even, I don't know that much about privatization, but even if it went forward, you're still going to be here. A lot of these things are still going to have to be done for the FAA to get involved with funding. So okay. that's not going to change. But if you don't have your ALP match, you're not going to fund You're not going to fund anything. Yeah, that's true. And so if your projects are outdated, they say, well, you have this whole project on there, and we're not going to pay for the things really need. So 